Hello again. This is Math 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage. And the title of this lecture is Probability, Randomness, and Law of Large Numbers, an Introduction. And as always, when watching this video, please be an active learner with pencil and paper nearby. Now, in this lecture, we start talking about discrete distributions. Previously, we talked about the normal uh, distribution, and th that is a continuous probability. Uh, and today, we're talking about discrete distributions. And we will return and talk about continuous again, so it's important to understand the difference between these two. So, a discrete distribution is one in which the data can take on certain values, for example, integers. A continuous distribution is one in which data can take on any value within a specified range, which may be infinite. So, for a discrete distribution, probabilities can be assigned to the values in the distribution. For example, the probability that the web page will have 12 quick clicks in an hour might be 0 0.15. In contrast, a continuous distribution has an infinite number of possible values, and the probability associated with any particular value of the distribution is null or zero. Therefore, continuous uh, distributions uh, are normally, uh, they're using that word here kind of um, in, in a double way, described in terms of a probability density function, which be converted into a probability that a value will fall within a certain range. And that was what we did with the normal distributions. But today we're talking about discrete distributions. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm going to tell you a story. Once upon a time, a statistics friend of mine amazed her students uh, the first day of class. She would come in and by lot assign each student to be either a faker or an experimenter. She didn't know who was what. And uh, she asked the fakers, to pretend that they tossed a coin that was fair a hundred times and they listed the uh, outcomes each time. So they put an H for head and a T for tails. She asked the experimenters to actually toss a coin a hundred times and list the things and record these things, put their names on them and turn them in. Now uh, she then, my, my instructor friend, would leave the room, she would come back and she would look at the papers and she was able to their great amazement to always tell the difference between the fakers and the experimenters. And here's what she did. The fakers almost always thought that what would happen is that the results would happen heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, pretty regularly. What happens in the real world is it is not uncommon to get streaks of tails and heads. And so what, uh, although in the end it will balance out. And so what happens is she uh, looked at this and she looked for these strings. Those were the experimenters, the others were the fakers. And she amazed them with this. You see, people don't generally understand what we mean by randomness. Now we're going to do a random experiment. It's going to involve uh, a pair of dice. Each of these is called a die. And you have six sides. Uh, it is a cube. Uh, we're going to assume that these are fair. And so you can have one. Uh, two doesn't show up on any of these. Uh, but there's a five, there's a four, there's a five, and there's a three. And you have a one through six uh, showing up here. And the six is on the top. Now we're going to think about having die that are of different colors. And we're going to roll these just like you would perhaps in a Monopoly game. Now, since we really can't roll the die, we're going to use an Excel function. And the Excel function we're going to use is called random between. And random between returns a random number, just like you're rolling a die, uh, between the two numbers you specify. So we're going to uh, say, well, we would like a random uh, integer between 1 and 6. And again, there it's returning you integers. Now, I do want to tell you that this um, function is volatile that means it will change and also it will change every time you touch uh, this function so you have to be a little bit careful and uh, I'm going to have uh, Linda um, demonstrate this uh, with me in our uh, VCM lecture but you have to be a little bit careful about that so we are using this Excel function to generate the random numbers Okay, so here's what I'm doing. I'm pretending that we have a yellow die and a butterscotch die, and I use the random function here 
I pull it down. I use the random function here, and I pull it down, and I add them together. But I have to deal with the volatility, so what I do is I copy and paste here to make these numbers not formulas. That's a detail. Uh, but then I sort them based on their sum. So you see, this enables me to do the experiment a large number of times very quickly. In fact, for this uh, exercise, I did it 100 times. And then I sorted them, and I just uh, sorted them by the sum. And I could count how many times did I get a 2, a 3, a 4, and so on and so forth. And so for each value, 2, 3, 4, I listed the frequency I just counted. And you see I got 5, 7, and 9. And then I could calculate the empirical probability. That is, how likely is it for me to get this? Well, I did it 100 times, and so 5 times out of 100. So that means the probability of getting a 2 as a sum is 0 0.05, and I counted all of these. Now, I call this empirical because uh, it is from an experiment, and so it's, it's derived from uh, observations. And you'll notice that all these numbers are bigger than 0, and they add up to 1. They have to add up to one. So this is the example of an empirical probability and an empirical calculation. So we can also approach this problem theoretically. Here I list the um, outcomes possible with the yellow die. And here I list the outcomes possible with the butterscotch colored die, and in here I list the sums. So you see this is all the possible outcomes, and let's suppose that it is fair, so each of these 36 different outcomes is possible. Now these are different outcomes, uh, even though the number is the same. So you see here, the yellow die was a 6, and the butterscotch die was a 5, but here the butterscotch die was a 6, and the other one was a 5. So there are two ways. So if I assume each of these is equally possible, there are 36 different outcomes. And so if I wanted to know what's the probability of getting a 5, I say how many ways could I end up with 5? 1, 2, 3, 4. That would be 4 over 36 or 1 over 9. Similarly, uh, it should maximize at, uh, at 7 uh, because uh, what will happen is that there are six ways to get seven, so that's going to be uh, one over six. So you see, this is different. This is not empirical, and you notice that the empirical doesn't match the theoretical. But uh, what I do is I will see that these will add up to one uh, still. They're all greater than zero. And, uh, and I put these uh, fractions in uh, lowest terms. So this is a theoretical probability. Now the law of large number said as time goes on, if I do this over and over and over again, the empirical will get closer and closer to the theoretical as the number of trials tends to infinity. That's called the law of large numbers. Okay, with that as a, a significant introduction, let's uh, use some definitions and stuff. So the word random suggests an unpredictable result or outcome. Um, and uh, predicting outcomes uh, when facing uncertainty is, uh, is challenging. Um, and one way to approach it is a simulation, which is actually what we did. A simulation is a technique to recreate a random event. They can be tactile, that is, I could actually have you flipping coins or rolling die, or they can be virtual using a computer to pretend it's flipping the coin. Now, in both instances, the, the goal is to measure how often something is observed, and that's an empirical experiment. Uh, now, uh, we are talking about then random processes. These are scenarios where the outcome of any particular trial is unknown, but the proportion uh, that observed approaches a specific value as the number of trials increases, or at least let me say that a different way, you hope it approaches that. Some things are truly, totally random. We can also then talk about probability. Probability is a measure of the likelihood of something occurring, and it deals with experiments. And so uh, what we do is, and let's just deal with in other words, probability describes how likely it is that something will happen. If we look at the proportion of times an event occurs over a long period of time, a large number of trials, we can be more certain of the likelihood of its occurrence. And we talked about that being the law of large numbers, which is stated here. Uh, and so that's... Um, that's uh, 
some important concepts for us to have in mind. Now, in probability, an experiment is any process with uncertain results that can be repeated. And so we did, uh, we can do the experiment of tossing these die like we did. And uh, in fact, this ends up being the set of outcomes. And that's, in fact, what we call a sample space. OK, so here, the sample space, capital S, of a probability experiment is a collection of all possible outcomes. So that is the stuff that we see inside the body of this table. Those are the possible outcomes are of our experiment. Now, an event is any collection of outcomes from a probability uh, experiment. An event consists of one or more outcomes of one or more or more than one outcome. And events are sometimes denoted uh, with uh, set numbers or letters like E. So we can talk about the probability of E. Now an event up here would be getting a seven or eight or nine or 12. Uh, so that means that an event is, in this case, defined to be what's the probability of getting a seven. So that's an example of a sample space and events. So in other words, an outcome is the result of one trial of an experiment. And the sample space is a list of all possible outcomes of a probability experiment. OK, uh, now in probability rules, the notation P of E is read the probability of E. That's the probability that event E happens. OK, and there are two rules of probability that we discuss here. The probability of any event is a number. It must be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. And if you add up all the probabilities, it must equal one. So if you add up all the probabilities of the events, it must equal uh, one. And a probability model lists all possible outcomes of a probability experiment. And so, um, in other words, rule one says probabilities are between zero and one, and so they can't be negative. And rule two says if you add them up, it must add up to one. OK, uh, let's look at another example. Suppose you were talking about the color of plain M&Ms can be brown, uh, yellow, red, blue, orange, or green. And the candy is selected randomly from a bag. And if you pull them out, you found out that, and let's suppose that there were um, just a hundred um, oh, uh, M&Ms in here, and each one was one of those colors. You could count how many of each color and divide by 100, and you could get this empirical probability. And this is a probability model because all these numbers are bigger than or equal to 1. And if I add the, those numbers up, I didn't do it here, but you could do this, and it adds up to 1. Note that an event could be impossible. Uh, for example, it is impossible that I ever will become a star in the National Basketball Association. Um, so the probability of that event is zero. Uh, there are events that are certain. Some people say death and taxes are certain. I think that is uh, true. So the probability of an event can be one. That's a certain event. It can be zero. That's an impossible event. And uh, we can approximate the probabilities using an empirical approach, and that's exactly what we did. The probability of E happening is how often does E happen, divided by the number of uh, times that we did the experiment. Okay, so for example, uh, an insurance agent uh, has uh, 182 teenage drivers that are aged 16 through 19, and 24 of them uh, filed claims. And so he could estimate from that experiment that 24 out of 182, or about 13%, would have accidental claims filed. Uh, similarly, you could do a survey. Uh, here, uh, the concept was you talked to 200 people and you said, how do you get to work? And these were the answers you allowed them. And so, and you made little notes of how frequently did each of these things happen. Uh, and so we estimate uh, the probability uh, that an individual carpools. Okay, so carpool, there were 22 out of, and there were a total of 200. So 22 out of 200 uh, would be 11%. Um, uh, so the probability is 11% uh, that they carpool. And the way you get from this to this is you divide by the summation of the frequencies to get a probability table. And this will add to one.
uh, and we did a classical method. That's where we did just the theoretical approach. And if we're assuming that the, we have equally likely outcomes, then the probability of the NE is the number of ways that E can occur divided by the number of possible ways. That's M over N, and this is the same uh, way, only using different notation. And in fact, uh, here they do the same example. There are things are uh, prettier, uh, but you can see that the, the red uh, shown in the red are the number of ways to get seven. There are six ways. So six out of 36 is one out of six. Um, okay, now here's another problem. Sophia has three tickets to a concert. But Yolanda, Michael, Kevin, and Marissa all want to go with her. So she randomly selects two people to go with her. And so uh, what's the sample space? Uh, compute the probability that Michael and Karen come. Compute the probability that Marissa attends and interpret the probabilities. Okay, well, here's the sample space. You see he, these are the number of different ways she can pick two people to go with her. So that is the sample space. It's listed right there. Now, the number in the sample space is six. Therefore, the probability that Michael and Kevin attend, that's only one of these six choices, is one over six. But Marissa uh, appears in um, three of those, uh, one, two, three. And so the probability that she will attend is 50%. And uh, you would expect if you did this uh, a thousand times, about half the time, Marissa would be attending the concert. Uh, I think this may be our last example, but suppose you uh, ask uh, 500 families with three children to disclose the gender of their family and you found that uh, 180 had two boys and uh, one girl. Well, you could estimate that probability because that would be 180 out of 500. You'd call that 36%. That's an empirical probability. But if you did the theoretical probability, you could say, well, the first child could be a boy or a girl. The second child could be a boy or a girl. And the third child could be a boy or a girl. And so you see which of these are two boys uh, and one girl. And so you could calculate the probability here. And these are the outcomes that could happen. So you could have BBB, BBG. B, G, B, you see those are different instances here, and so on and so forth. So the probability of um, uh, getting two boys and a girl is three of those are two boys. One, two, and three out of eight is 37 and a half. And you can see there's pretty good agreement between this number and this number. And last but not least, a subjective probability is kind of a guess. I watch uh, CNN a lot, and they t say, well, what's the probability of something happen? They really don't know. They just guess. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. May God bless you all.